We're kicking off season 36 of Outdoor Wisconsin here at the Horicon Marsh Education and Visitor Center, where this fantastic woolly mammoth sculpture greets everyone who comes here to explore the marsh and its history. In this first show of the new season, we'll focus on winter fun. In just a few minutes, Elizabeth Kramer joins a group of cold weather hikers for the annual walk across Lake Winnebago. And then Jeff Kelm joins a Waukesha High School group for an ice fishing outing on Fowler Lake. But first, I'll go ski-joring in the Southern Kettle Moraine with dog-powered sports enthusiast Tim Birch. I'm Dan Small, and it's time once again for Outdoor Wisconsin. Summer to fall, winter to spring, from Green Bay to where the same, Croix sings from Kettle Moraine to Superior Shore. Outdoor Wisconsin, Outdoor Wisconsin. Old-time duck hunters used marsh skis like these to get into hard-to-reach places on Horicon Marsh. Last winter, I wore cross-country skis to try my hand at ski drawing on the Scuppernong Trail in the Kettle Moraine State Forest with Tim Birch of Milwaukee Mushers and his Alaskan Husky Stormy and Hunter. Anbai. Anbai. I've come out with Tim Birch to the Scuppernong Trail here in the southern unit of the Kettle Moraine State Forest in Waukesha County, and it's a perfect day for cross-country skiing today. But Tim does it with uh, the added boost of dog power. Tim, they call this ski jarring, I understand, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's a uh, Scandinavian term, mm -hmm. ski jarring, or sometimes you'll hear it pronounced ski jarring. Hey, let's go. It's uh, started in Scandinavia, Norway, or uh -huh. Sweden. If you want to experience world-class speed, then you hook yourself to a couple of Alaskan Huskies, or, or in Europe they use uh, 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 pointer crosses, Euro hounds. They mix some great greyhound in there, and, and they're really fast dogs. Uh, uh, my dogs here are uh, more of a distance uh, breed. These are the ones that are used in the Iditarod. Come back, come back. That's a great way to uh, exercise your dog, spend time in the outdoors, and um, I don't like to have to ski slow, so, but if I'm on by myself, that's, I'm stuck with it. But with these guys, you know, we can get moving down the trail pretty good. Now these are Alaskan Huskies, mm -hmm. and how old are they? They're each about five years old. Uh -huh. um, Hunter is about a uh, half year older than his cousin, Storm. Whoa, easy, take a break. If someone is going to do this, Tim, what are the special uh, concerns they have to have? Obviously, you got to have a dog. Yeah. Right? Well, there's and a friendly there's, one it's, like this. It's, uh, <laughs> it's I call it an orphan sport because there's not really a whole lot of people who do this, despite how much fun it is. But I think once you you experience it, it's it's really uh, it's really great. Uh, to me, it's way more fun than snowmobiling. It's not smelly or noisy, yeah. and then you get to cuddle up with them when you're done. You know, you yeah. can't do that with a snowmobile. You need dogs that want to run, and more, even more than that, they need to be able to pull and they need to be able to uh, head down the trail. I mean, you might have a dog that like goes to a dog park and runs all over the place, but you don't want that on the trail. You want one that's just going to follow the trail and, and go. You also need to be able to ski. Uh -huh. uh, I have people who, who see me do this and then they're like, oh, that's great. You know, I got a dog that uh, really you know, loves the winter, loves to uh, run around outside. I say, okay, well, do you ski? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, you really, uh, before you strap yourselves with some dogs, you better be able to uh, control yourself on the skis. And training the dogs too, uh, if you have a dog that isn't bred for this, a lot of people, they'll have maybe uh, Siberian Husky, you know, this is what people typically think of when they think of sled dogs, the big fluffy Siberian Huskies. Those are really bred nowadays, most of them are bred for show. They're, they, they, these dogs, they're Alaskan Huskies, but they're not uh, a registered breed because there's no breed standard. They're, they're bred for performance, not appearance. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing with the, the Siberian Huskies is they've had a lot of that working breed bred out of them. So it, it takes quite a bit to uh, retrain those dogs. And I'll tell people, you know, uh, come see me in the fall. As soon as the temperatures get um, usually in the 40s, that's when I start running them. They, they, you know, in the, in the, they get the summers off. Yeah. Uh, it's just too hot for them. But uh, once the temperatures get a little cooler in the fall, then we start on wheels, uh, bikes, or um, I do can across too. It's like cross-country mm -hmm. running mm -hmm. with uh, 
uh, dogs. And most people will uh, skate ski. Yeah. Uh, if you're used to classic cross-country skiing, uh, striding, that works, but it's, uh, it's not as efficient or as fast. Uh, it, the one advantage it has is you can go pretty much anywhere. You don't really need a groomed trail for, for classic skiing. All right, let's go. Hop. What we're doing today, we have uh, uh, a nice groomed trail. We're really lucky. That's the other thing. <laughs> you need a safe place to train. And because it's an orphan sport, there's not a lot of places that let you do this. There's some trails in Franklin that I maintain, and uh, we have a group of people come out and use that all the time. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's finding a place that's uh, long enough distance. You don't want to run them on pavement, and you certainly don't want to run them with traffic. And that's uh, you know what's one of the, the keys is to find a safe place to work with your dog. Now the dogs have special harnesses. There's all sorts of different types of harnesses. This is a, the classic, what they call X-back. So you can see why they call it an X-back. Oh, sure. Uh, there's uh, di uh, distance harnesses or H-back harnesses or fast-back harnesses. But, uh, and, you, and you usually can't find these in stores. You have to go online and find them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, any kind of uh, you know, working pulling harness, uh, is generally fine, and then you need a way to attach the line. Here we go. So this has a, a bungee in it, oh, yeah. which is um, really it's it's there for like when you wipe out, which you, you end up doing quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> you stop, and the dogs don't, and you don't want them to get jerked like that. So right. there's a little bit of a shock absorber yeah. there, and then you need a the belt here. These are a belt of my own design. It's just a a, a padded work belt mm -hmm. to which I've uh, sewed on some straps. You want this belt on your hips, on your girdle, mm -hmm. so it's uh, not on your waist, but on 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 your bones, and so it rides a little bit lower. And the straps are there to keep it from riding up. Okay. So they don't have to be really tight. They just have to be there so it doesn't ride up and make it fall off your back. Well, Tim, I think Hunter's ready to go. <laughs> yeah, I think he likes you. Oh, you, you gonna pull me, huh? You're not gonna pull me down in the snow, are you? Let's I think go. I'm gonna give you Stormy. She's actually okay. a little bit slower. All right, well, that's uh, good. <laughs> they're both, they're both, they're both pull good, but, but he's got a little more top end speed. He, he looks so. a little stronger, too. Yeah. Good, be a good girl, come on. Sit, sit, honey. Good girl. Put me up there. Whoa, You're gonna whoa, have to be ready. whoa, whoa. <laughs> All right, what do I need to know uh, <laughs> besides wall? If you want to go left, you say ha. Ha, If you okay. want to go right, you say G. G and ha, okay. Uh, if you want to slow down, you say just easy or e whoa. Easy or whoa, okay. And uh, stop, stay. There's okay. really no brakes other than snow plow. Yeah, okay. So, okay, um, well, I think try to, try to avoid the trees. Avoid the trees, yeah, okay. Well, easy is, uh... All right, come here, honey. <clears throat> do you want to leave, or should I go up oh, first? Well, you, you'll pass me in a second here, I'm sure. Okay, Stormy. Go, go, Stormy. Hey, easy, easy, easy. Good girl. Ha-ha. Yes, good girl. Woo-hoo. On by, on by, on by. Hike, 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 hike. On by, on by. Go get him. Hike, hike, hike. Go, 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 go. On by. I'm back. I'm back. Hey. Good girl. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Easy, 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 ha, ha. easy. Whoa. Well, I don't know who had more fun, you and me or the dogs, but they sure enjoyed it. Uh, they yeah, they live for it. They, they live for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Whoa, 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 whoa. This was great. Um, I'd do it again. And if somebody wants to get into this, is there a group that uh, organizes outings or? We have a, a Facebook group that I uh, manage, and uh, we train in some trails down in Franklin, mm -hmm. and uh, it's called the Milwaukee Mushers. So okay. if people are interested, uh, just look us up on Facebook. If you're in Madison, there I know there's a, a group there. Uh -huh. If you're in the Twin Cities, there's a big group in, the, in, in Minnesota. Yeah. Um, there's a, the Windy City Mushers down in uh, Illinois. So there's just go online and just po start poking around. You'll find something. All right. But that's the thing is find someone to help you. You know, to help you uh, train your dogs and get you off on the right foot. Well, this was a lot of fun. And I'll tell you what, if you've got skis and a dog, you got to give it a try.
Many of the trails here at Horicon Marsh are open year-round for hiking, biking, and cross-country skiing. Last February, Elizabeth Kramer hiked a trail that's open only in the winter. It crosses the frozen waters of Lake Winnebago. Today I am on the shores of one of our largest lakes in Wisconsin for an event that combines charity with a little winter fun. Join me for a walk across Lake Winnebago. My name is Jordan Vanderloop and I am the event organizer for Walk Across Lake Winnebago. And it started back in 2003 when my mom actually, um, they were at a supper club on the east side of Lake Winnebago and she forgot her purse there. So the next morning she got up, it was a gorgeous day, the sun was out and she got two other girlfriends to walk across the lake, the lake with her to retrieve her purse. After that, it just carried on from there. I mean, it went from three people to 20 people to 60 people, and now we have over 800 people sometimes walking across Lake Winnebago. So you had one sled the first year, two sleds this year. Next year, yeah. we might have a keg. <laughs> Next year, a keg. The keg sled will go You know, across. it's a barter system out there on the ice, too, so extra beer can buy you shots or snacks. Or... Like a little ride yeah. part of the way. Yep, yep. you got to well, come prepared. you got to come prepared, and you guys did. Well, have a great walk. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Enjoy the day. It's amazing how many people come out, and how long is it? Um, total, it's about 10 miles. There's uh, about a mile on the other side when you start down to the lake. And then um, probably a little over eight miles across, and then just the short distance from once you get to land here and then back up to the bar. Another thing about how this walk has really propelled into a community event is the charity aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. For the animals. Over the years, we've raised $50,000 for the Nina Animal Shelter. Um, and then we started doing it for the Menasha Canine Unit a couple of years ago. We raised money for that. And then um, this year we're doing it for the Nina Canine Unit and the Nina Menasha Water Rescue. So I'm Officer Mulroy from the Nina Police Department. This is Canine Bobby. He has just turned two in November. He's a two-year-old uh, mix between a German Shepherd and a Belgian Malinois. What is his role as far as the canine unit? Uh, so Bobby is a, he's a, what they call a dual purpose patrol dog. Um, he's trained and certified to detect uh, the odors of illegal narcotics as well as uh, patrol work. Patrol work is uh, basically stuff that, you know, keeps officers safe. Um, um, so he's trained to, you know, clear buildings without me being there. He can clear buildings and um, let us know if a bad person's in there or anything like that. He can also track uh, suspects as well as track an individual walks away from, you know, like a group home or something like that. He's trained to track, so it's to help the community out as well as catch the bad guys. So this event, Walk Across Winnebago, um, partly sponsors the Nina yep. Menasha Canine Unit. Yep. And you have two canines? Yep, two canines right now. Um, okay. Canine Cedric is due to retire in December. So that's what, you know, fundraising today is helping towards go to the next uh, canine. How much does it cost to, you know, secure one of these canines and get them trained up to be part of the force? Uh, 115000 was the total for Canine Bobby. That includes him, the training uh, for me and him to go through, um, paying for him, and then as well as the squad car and all the special equipment that has to go in the squad car. What does all of this mean to you as someone who's on the force? working with Bobby to see the community come out to support you like this. It's amazing how, how, I mean, even last year when we were fundraising for him out here, I mean, the weather is great this year out there, but how many people came out to, to support us and everything like that, it was insane how many people came out in the horrible freezing conditions, you know, to do this event and to help us fundraise for the dog. So it, it means a lot to us. It's, um, um, I know it's important for them to have you know, everyone likes the dog and the, what the dog can do and everything like that, but it's important to have the, the backing of the community as well. Anything can happen when you're out on any sort of water. I mean, whether it's frozen or not, but um, it's nice to be able to have the equipment that they need to, to do their job. Today, mm -hmm. I see you guys have taken some different precautions. Talk a little bit about the aspect of safety when it comes to doing the walk. We work really closely with a local fishing club that plows the road, and they don't plow a road unless there's 
you know, 15 to 20 inches of ice out there. So yesterday they went out, they drilled over 200 holes all the way across and made sure that there was a nice enough ice out there for us. No ice is 100% safe all the time. You have to be very aware of your surroundings, aware of the ice conditions. As Jordan mentioned earlier, um, they're testing the ice uh, up until, well, this morning they were still testing areas. And they put out the walkway this morning and by 10.30, we were out there looking at areas and it changed. We had to reroute everybody uh, changing the last mile or so of the course. What kinds of things should people be cautious of if they are out on the ice, taking a walk, um, maybe not even as part of this event, but just kind of ice skating, playing on the ice? Walk on areas, drive on areas that other people have been out on. Um, the local fishing clubs do a wonderful job of marking trails and keeping roads plowed on the ice. They also are always checking ice depths. Just in general, be aware of when you're out on the water, out on the ice, making sure that people know where you're at. Don't just venture out by yourself not telling anybody where you're going. Let somebody know where you're going, when you should be home. Da, da, da. The brave little four-year-old did it! <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Say yeah! <laughs> You're such a champ. You live on the lake, you organize this event. What does all of this mean to you? Um, it's funny because you hear a lot of people say that January, February months get so long and there's nothing to do. And just to be able to get people out there and enjoy the winter and just take it all in and know that there's tons of things to do in Wisconsin when <laughs> in the winter time, especially when you've got enough snow and good ice. As far as what it means to me, I don't know, I just love seeing everybody out there. I mean, just first timers coming up here, they're like, oh, I made it. Oh, that was a long, that was a longer route than I thought. And so it's just kind of cool to hear everybody's responses and, and experiences. Oh my God, it was amazing and awesome. We had so much fun. Hey guys, how was it? Good. Awesome. How the Love puppies it. do? Good. They did very well. They're ready to go back home and get in their bed. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did it take you? Four, Four hours. hours. Four hours all the way across. How was it? It was awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so is this a family tradition now? It's yeah. gonna be. I think so. Awesome. We'll, we'll bring thank... more beverages and we'll bring more trading gear. And, <laughs> I think this will be a... and, and more people. <laughs> more family. Yeah. 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 This year's walk is scheduled for February 1st, and we'll tell you how to learn more in just a bit. Another winter sport that's really popular across the ice belt is ice fishing. Last winter, Jeff Kelm joined Waukesha High School teacher Joe Jenna and a group of special education students for an ice fishing outing on Fowler Lake. See, now you guys drilled your own perfect hole. How do you like that? Mm, nice. We've got kids from Waukesha West, North, and South. The director of special ed from school district, Jason Gahan, approached me and Jake Forstack from South and asked us if we could put together some outdoor activities for our students with special needs and then pair them up with some mentors and come out and have some fun, do some things that the kids normally wouldn't do. Push. Like this. So the activity that we chose for today was ice fishing. And so we've got about 15 kids from each school, from north, south, and west, uh, special ed students. And then about, uh, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio of mentors. And so we've got close to 90 kids out on the ice here with us today. Take this uh, metal part yeah. and well, it, put it in between, we'll put the one. two metal in between. There you go, there just you like go. that. Good job. Good. See this bottom. Keep letting it go. Why did you want to participate in today? Well, first of all, I just love ice fishing. I love fishing in general. I do it all the time whenever I have free time. But then I've caught a lot of fish, you know. But some of these kids out here, they don't get to do this a lot. I like teaching other kids now how to fish. It's just, I've moved away from catch, catch, catch to teach. I like teaching now. Keep it tight for me. Yep, just like that. Just slide right through your hand. It's perfect. There you go. Just like that. And then, okay, we'll you let go. And we'll set the tip up again. So all you gotta do is slide this, hook it on there. And then when fish pulls on this line, 
it spins up on top, and the flag comes up. So that's how you know if there's a fish on it. Riley, these are kids you see in the hall every day. These are kids that, that you know. Does that add a level of, of it being that much more special when you get to do this and if it wasn't just you know kids coming from, from wherever? Yeah, it makes them a little more personal, knowing them and you see them every day, so you create memories with them. Then you go and put them on a fish, it might come back to you next week, next month. Hey, remember when I caught that fish? And it kind of warms your heart a little bit, makes you feel like you're doing something good. So what you're going to do is you're going to reel this way, like that. Okay, like, 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 like up like this? Yep, like that way. We have parents out here helping out and everything. This is one of those labors of love. So run that all the way down to the bottom, and then that should stir up some dust. I'm parents. We're showing some kids. Uh, what it's like to be out on the ice fishing. Um, we got a bunch of tip-ups out and shacks with heaters and uh, some of these kids have never been on the ice before. And um, ice fishing's pretty cool. Especially when you get a flag popping up, which means that the fish grabs it and the flag goes from down to up and everyone yells flag and runs to it. There's nothing there. That's why we're going out here every time. You know what they call it? That's called fishing and not catching. Yeah. Oh, hey, that's the fun of it. So Brandon, if you hold the line like this, then yeah. he can use two hands to wind that up. So just real lightly like that. Yeah. What, what kind of experience do you see them taking out of these mentor experiences, especially when they're mentored by, by fellow students? Yeah, uh, I think these are kids that they, a lot of times normally wouldn't have the opportunity to socialize with. And it's unbelievable. Our mentors are the best. They are absolutely the best. And so I think these kids are going to walk away with some new friendships and just opportunities, experiences here, um, you know, that, um, yeah, they normally otherwise wouldn't have. No fish on this one. I think the minnow just figured it. It's okay. Next time we'll get them. Reel them in. There you go. Come. All right. Look at that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to unhook them and you can put them back in there, okay? What does it mean to be able to put an effort outside the class, give them something non-traditional to learn? How do you feel at the end of the day after all of this comes together? I know for me personally, this is just so rewarding and I, I love it, absolutely love it. High five! Good job. Be able to share this with my students and the kids from North and South, you can't put a price tag on this. You can't formally put this in any curriculum anywhere, and yet I hope this is just one of the best experiences for these kids. We'll continue the winter fun theme for the next two weeks as Elizabeth Kramer heads to Bayfield County for some dog sledding and ice fishing. Here's a taste of what's coming up on those shows. <music> Bayfield is a city known for its summertime activities, but being able to spend time with these cold weather women in the snow and on the ice brought new perspective to an already beloved part of Wisconsin. Let's go guys. To learn more about this week's features, log on to milwaukeepbs.org and search local programs for Outdoor Wisconsin, or visit the Milwaukee PBS Facebook page. Well, next time, Elizabeth Kramer goes dog sledding in Bayfield County. Jeff Kelm looks at new high-tech ice fishing accessories, and Wisconsin Turkey Commander Lauren Voss shows us how to make a turkey call from the wing bones of a wild turkey. 
Saying goodbye from Horicon Marsh, I'm Dan Small. Join us again next week for Outdoor Wisconsin. Of a white tail moving through the pine Long vowel of the owl in the evening Loon on the lake, a muskie on the line Outdoor Wisconsin Free yourself like an eagle in the air Feed yourself like a bear in the blackberry Like a hawk, perch and stare Outdoor Wisconsin When the working life is way too much You're in too deep, way out of touch Lace up your boots, get out of town I Walk in the wild, I sit down and listen Listen to the sounds of the critters of the night To the wind and the leaves and the little river run Coyote brother howling in the moonlight Outdoor Wisconsin Hike, fish, hunt, camp, sail, canoe Ski, photograph, laugh, do what you want to Stick your nose where the wild rose grows Outdoor Wisconsin Outdoor Wisconsin Outdoor Wisconsin